What's going on guys, assalamu alaikum, welcome to Amigos Code. In this video, I'm going to teach you about Spring Boot 3. Spring Boot 3 is the latest version of Spring Boot. And to be honest, it has come a long way with awesome features that allows you as a developer to build backend applications off the ground really quick. So that is the power of Spring Boot. In this course, I'm going to give you a quick overview of Spring Boot. Then I'm going to show you how to build an API connected to a real database running on Docker. Along the way, I'm going to give you also exercises to make sure that you are challenged along the way. Go ahead and smash the like button, comment down below. And without further ado, let's go ahead and learn about Spring Boot 3. I actually forgot to mention that this course is available on the website where you can take the course at your own pace with subtitles. So it's very important, something that a lot of students have been asking me and I've been adding subtitles. So I wrote a tool using Golang that allows me to add subtitles to uh, the courses that I have on the website. So this course specific has subtitles and I'll be updating the rest of the courses to also have subtitles. Also, there is a certificate waiting for you when you complete this course on the website. That way you can showcase your new achievement on LinkedIn. As I said, we're going to learn about Spring Boot 3. And right here, I'm um, within the official documentation for Spring Boot. And you can see that the latest version is 3. And by the time you watch this video, this might be 3.0.123 or 3.1 or 3.2. But the biggest thing here is that you will not see a major release. So this won't be version four. So everything that you learn from this video will apply to all versions of Spring Boot and its minor releases. So Spring Boot makes it easy to create standalone production grade Spring based applications that you can just run. So here you can see that you can create standalone Spring applications, embedded Tomcat, Jetty or Undertow, which I'm going to show you in a second. And um, basically you can uh, plug in a bunch of external configuration that allows you to speed up the process as well as libraries. So Spring Boot 3 has come a long way. And in here, if I click on learn, you can see that you can basically check the reference documentation. And here you can see that this is a very extensive documentation that um, gives you pretty much everything that you need in order to learn Spring Boot. So basically, this is pretty much how I learn Spring Boot when there is a new uh, feature that they introduce. So in here, what I want to show you actually, so the newer version of Spring Boot is that it officially has support for Java 17. And one of the big things also is GraalVM native image support. So basically, you can create a native execution from your application using GraalVM. Now, if you don't know what GraalVM is, so in here, I'm within their official page, but basically GraalVM is an advanced optimized compiler that generates faster and cleaner code requiring fewer compute resources. So compile Java applications ahead of time native binary that can start up instantly and deliver peak performance with no warm up time. So you can see that it's actually uh, used by, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Alibaba, Nvidia, Goldman Sachs, and all of these big tech companies. And the thing is, it's, it's polyglot as well. So it's available for different programming languages. So in this course, we're not going to cover GraalVM, but I just want to let you know that with Spring Boot 3, there is support for GraalVM. Cool. I'm super excited to teach you about Spring Boot 3. Without further ado, let's kick off. So as I said, Spring Boot is an amazing framework that gives you everything you need in order to build applications. If you need security, you can use security modules available. If you need logging, 
you can use the logging integration connecting to databases whether you want to connect to mongodb postgres mysql they made it super easy for you as a developer to connect to any database metrics so checking how your application is behaving in production and the cool thing is is that it's very easy for you to learn as a beginner as you'll see in this course also it's production ready you can build microservices has dependency injection built in configuration great community and a bunch more All right, in here I'm within Spring Initializer and this is how you can pretty much bootstrap a Spring Boot application. Now for the project, let's choose Maven and for the language, we're going to choose Java. For the Spring Boot version three, so we are learning about Spring Boot three. So choose anything that has a three in it. By the time that you watch this video, maybe this will be 3.0.1 as you've got in the snapshot or maybe 3.0.2 or 3.1.1 for example so as long as it's a 3 so version 3 everything should just work if it's 4 so this will be a major version and obviously there might be some breaking changes so here we are learning about spring boot 3 so just choose 3 then for the Project metadata, let's together say com.amigos and then code. Now, obviously here, this could be pretty much anything that you want. So com.yourname, com.alex, com.jamila. And for the artifact, I'm going to choose spring-boot-example. And I'm going to leave the name as default, description as default. Then for the package name, com.amigos code. So I need this package in here and packaging jar. And then the version of Java 17. So Spring Boot 3 has been upgraded to work with Java 17 and above. So if you want to follow along with the exact same version, please choose 17. And if you don't see 17 in here, just bear with me because I'm going to show you exactly how to change this. Awesome. Then we have dependencies in here. So let's just click on dependencies. And in here, we can add a bunch of dependencies that allows us to get off the ground. For example, if we want to build RESTful applications, we can use Spring Web. Stuff for GraphQL, we've got this dependency, REST repositories, sessions. You can see uh, uh, security, Spring Security, OAuth, JDBC. And you can see that this list is quite extensive. For now, what we need is, so in here, so let's just, select web and then spring web click on it and at this point if i click on explore you can see that this is just given me just hold on a second this is actually loading but you can see that this is just a maven project with everything that uh, we specified within the ui so let's just close this i'm going to walk you through in a second close and then generate and then here, I want to save this to my desktop. Next, let's open up this folder with IntelliJ. Cool. So let me extract this folder. There we go. And in the description of this video, you should find this zip right here that will enable you to follow along with the exact same configuration that I have, if you need to do so. And for this course, we're going to use JetBrains toolbox alongside with IntelliJ Ultimate. So IntelliJ Ultimate is the IDE of choice for many Java software engineers, and it's the one that I recommend. Now, this right here is a paid version, and I'm going to give you a coupon code, which you can find under the description of this video, where you can get it for three months. Also, if you are a student, you are eligible for IntelliJ Ultimate for a year and you can renew it as long as you are a student. So go ahead and basically download and install JetBrains Toolbox and then install IntelliJ Ultimate. Once you have that, open IntelliJ and in here, navigate to open and then just open the folder that we've just extracted. So Spring Boot Example. And then there we go. So if I put this full screen, 
just give it a second and this is good stuff so basically you can see that we have the parent folder in here then we have mvn so this is a wrapper in case you don't have maven installed locally so you get this out of the box and then you have src main and then java with the package that we specified and then spring boot example inside and then you have static templates and then application dot properties also within test you've got a simple test in here and you have some git ignore stuff the readme and in here that's the wrapper that I was telling you about for maven and then you have palm.xml now I want to show you how to properly set up the Java environment. So within IntelliJ, go ahead and go to the menu items in here, click on file and then project structure. Now you'll be presented with project settings. So here you can see the name SDK and this is where you can change it. So if this is anything but 17, or below 17 make sure that you change it to 17 or above again 17 or above because the new version of spring boot requires 17 as the minimum SDK so here you can basically click on this arrow and you can see I've got 16 11 but if you want you can basically add and then say download JDK and then here you can select the version so let's just say that we want to have 19 for example and then for the vendor you can choose oracle open jdk and depending on your architecture so with me i'm on um, arch 64 if you're not so if you're using intel just use the one without arch 64. so let's just basically select the adopt open jdk in here from eclipse temerin for my case so this is version 19. i'm not going to use 19 but i'm just showing you how to download so download and i think this was really quick cool then we can set the language level in here and you can see that we can go all the way to i think for now it's 19 in here right so or you can try the experimental features and then say accept and then apply and now you can see that it has changed so this is how you do it also, you see that you have platform settings. So platform settings, SDK, and basically you could choose uh, in here as well. So 11, 17, 19, the one I've just installed. And you have the global libraries as well, which we kind of don't need at this point. Cool, if I go to modules here, if you have multiple modules, you can select the language level per module as well. So let me go back to project. And then here, let me go back to OpenJDK 17. And in here, I'm not going to use the preview pattern matching switch. I'm just going to leave as default. So 17 seal types and uh, always trick floating point semantics. Apply and then OK. Let's inspect pom.xml next. All right, let's learn about the pom.xml. If I click on it and put it full screen, you can see that this is the XML configuration that we kind of specified within Spring Initializer. So here, remember, com.amigos code, Spring Boot example. This is the version and then the name. So we can change all of this. And then here we have some properties, Java 17. So if you want to change this to 18, 19, or any version above 17, you can do it in here. And then we have dependencies. So this is a dependency that we've just chose. So Spring Boot Startup Web and comes from org.springframework.boot. And by default in here, it comes with Spring Boot Starter Test for testing. Then we have the build section that contains the Spring Boot Maven plugin. And um, to be honest, this is it. Now, what I want to talk to you about is in here, parent. So basically, this is the dependency manage feature that manages the versions of common dependencies. So here, 
have a look. So within parent, we have Spring Boot Starter and then Parent. And this is a startup project that provides the default configuration for Spring based applications. And the cool thing about it is that we actually can omit versions when we want to use any dependency which comes from the parent. So in here, have a look Spring Boot Starter Web. So in here, we're not saying version and then specifying the version. No. So that is managed for us. The same with test in here. So this dependency. And uh, that's a good thing because we can just keep the versions across the entire project managed by one single place. And that is if you want to use a different version of Spring Boot, you could just change in here and then everything should just work provided that if there is a major change, you fix your application to work with the version that you bumped. Cool. This is pretty much the pom.xml. Next, what I want to do is start the project and then we're going to delete a few things and then start from scratch. If I close pom.xml and in here, you see that we have this class Spring Boot example application. If I click on it, it contains some code in here and uh, basically we can actually run this. So just to make sure that everything is working for you, make sure that you can run the application in here. So click run or here or here, or you can right click and then run the application. So let's just run and you should get this exact same thing as I have in here. So this should say Tomcat started on port 8080. If this is the case, then everything is working fine for you and you are good to go. If not, just let me know and I'll be able to help you. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to stop this and you see all of these annotations and whatnot. So let's actually basically start from scratch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete this file and the package. So let's just delete all of it as well as com. So just have the Java folder in here. Then static, we don't need static for now. Templates, we don't need templates for now. Application properties, we'll talk about it in a second. And then the test as well. So in here, let's just delete that. And also com. And let's just leave Java in here. The target, this is because when you run the project, this was generated for you. So we can also delete it, but it will come back again. Also, I'm going to delete the readme file in here. So delete. And if you have Maven installed locally, you can delete .mvn as well as this one. So mvn and the command as well. The last thing that I want you to do is to open the edit configuration and delete it. So this no longer applies. So we need to delete this guy. There we go. Apply. And we are good to go. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I want you to learn how to put a Spring Boot application from the ground up. So here you've learned about the pom.xml and then all of this is just a Maven project and we already have the dependencies. Next, let's go ahead and start our journey towards learning Spring Boot. We have everything configured. Now let's go ahead and build a simple hello world program. So in here, open up SRC. So this is the structure of a Maven project. You've got SRC as well as the POM. Within you have main. So this is where all of your uh, Java code will reside. Resources for files and HTML files and etc. Also, you have test. So this is where the testing code for your application resides as well. So here within main Java, let's right click new and then package. Say com dot and here I'm going to say amigos code. Obviously this has to be your name or your organization. Enter inside. Let's create a new Java class. And for the class name, I'm going to say main. So this will be our main class. Awesome. Now within this main class, let's have the main method. And for now, I'm just going to print to the console. Hello. So if I run this, you can see we have two play buttons 
or we can right click run or you can right click on the class itself you can see there's a play button in here we could just basically run from here so either way just run the application and you should see hello nice now in order for this to be a spring boot application we have to add a few things so one is we have to say that this is a spring boot application so this is the special annotation that we have to add and you can see that this comes from org so if i collapse this org spring framework dot boot dot auto configure dot spring boot application so this is the annotation itself and also so let's just get rid of this line now we also have to say spring and then application so this time from org spring framework dot boot dot and then run and inside we have to pass the main so we have to say main dot class comma and then args so args is anything that comes from the command line so basically this string array then let me add a semicolon here and we are good to go so we'll come back to this application in a second but with this annotation and this line right here we have a spring boot application that we can run to see this in action go ahead and run the application and this time you should see that the logs are a little bit different so here you can see that it says spring and by the way my font is quite big so that you can see everything properly but let me just put this full screen so you can see spring and have a look so here you can see that we have starting main using java 17 and then we have no profile set so it's falling back to the default and then you can see that starting service tomcat i'll talk about tomcat in a second and if you look carefully here it says tomcat started on port 8080 with context path and then empty and you can see how long it took to start main so 1.066 seconds and currently we have a web server up and running so we have a process which is running on port 8080 listening for requests and there we go so we have a spring boot application up and running next let's go ahead and talk about the tomcat web server in here and then we'll change our application so that when we make a request we return a response You saw that Tomcat started on port 8080, but what exactly is Tomcat? Tomcat or Apache Tomcat is a free and open source implementation of the Jakarta servlet and WebSocket technologies. And it provides a pure Java HTTP web server environment in which Java code can also run. Thus, it's a Java web application server. This is by the way, from Wikipedia. But in here, you can see that this is our web server. So maybe this is somewhere on the cloud. And within our web server, we have the Tomcat, and this is the embedded server container. And here inside also we have the Spring Boot application. So each Spring Boot application includes an embedded web server, which means that anyone can send requests on a given port which the servlet container is listening on. So in our case, 8080. So that's what you saw that Tomcat was listening on 8080. And then we can basically process the request and send a response to any given client. Now, Tomcat is one of many embedded web servers available, but we can use, for example, Jetty. So Jetty, provides a web server and a server container, additionally providing support for HTTP2, WebSocket, so on and so forth. So you can see all the features, and this is from Eclipse Foundation, by the way. And you also have Undertow. And if you decide to change, for example, from Apache Tomcat to Jerry, I'll show you the documentation in a second. So we have Tomcat, which is listening on port 8080. Now let's try and interact with our application and see whether the request will be received or not. So back to my web browser and within the address bar, go ahead and type 
localhost and then colon and then 8080. So literally just say localhost 8080. Press enter and have a look. We have a white label error page. This application has no explicit mapping for forward slash error. So you are seeing this as a fallback. There was an expected error 404 not found. So you learn about status codes in a second as well. But basically we send a request to our web server and it actually received the request, but nothing was found. Therefore, it couldn't process the request. If I stop the application, so in here, so I'm going to stop the application. So just stop and you can see that in here. So process finished and nothing is running. Let's go back to the web browser. And if I send the same request to 8080, you can see that this site can't be reached, which means that our embedded web server is down. So it's not running. Next, let me show you how to configure the embedded web server. Within IntelliJ, go ahead and select the resources folder under SRC main and inside you see that we have resources. So create a new file in here and this will be called application dot and then in here, let's just say YAML. Now within this application dot YAML, this is how we can configure various aspects of our Spring Boot application. And one of them is the server. So the embedded server. So let's say that we want to change the port. So currently it's running on port 8080. If we want to change the port, we could just say server and you can see that we can change various things. So server and this is YAML syntax. So server port and this can be, let's say 3000 for example. So here we are changing the port and you can see 3000. Now if I run the application and then you can see that if I scroll to the right, so the port now is 3000. If I go back to Chrome and in here, if I try 8080, I get nothing. So site can't be reached because there's nothing running on that port. But instead we change it to run on port 3000. So 3000, just like that. And you can see the white label error page. We'll change this in a second, but currently I'm just showing you how you can change your web server. Also, let's say that you want to build a Spring Boot application without a web server. So how do you turn off the web server? Well, if I go back to IntelliJ and then hide, and in here, what I want to say is Spring, and then main, and then web application, and then type. And here you can see that the default is servlet, or I can say none. Now, if I run this, and by the way, just make sure that the indentation is correct. So server colon and then port colon spring main, and then just follow the exact same thing as you see here. And this is what's called the YAML syntax. If I reload now, and you can see that the application just started and basically we disable the web server. So there's nothing running anywhere, right? So you can see that it just ran and um, it just died. So here, I don't think that you ever want to create an application. Um, maybe yes, maybe not, but most of the times this will be, so here will be servlet or reactive. So let's just stick with servlet. If you don't want to include this at all, you can delete it, but the default is servlet. If I run, you can see that now it's running on port 3000. You can see that now it's running on port 3000 in here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this back to 8080. Reload. And you can see that it's on port 8080. Now, if you want to learn more about how to configure, how to change your configuration, you can go to this link where I'm going to leave in the description of this video, where you can find the entire documentation. So this is the official documentation and you can see that each Spring Boot application includes an embedded web server, 
how to use another web server. So if you want to switch from Tomcat to Jerry, for example, this is how you do it. So basically you exclude and then you say just use Jetty instead. Here you can see that if you want to, so if I scroll down, if you want to disable the web server as we've done, if you want to um, change the port, you can use a random port and basically you can do a bunch of things, right? And also what I didn't show you is that we have properties syntax or YAML version. So in here, have a look. We have uh, this syntax or properties, which is spring uh, dot and then basically using the dot syntax, spring dot main web application, so on and so forth. So we'll cover the application dot properties or YAML file later. But for now, if you want to learn more about, for example, how to configure SSL, HTTP2, so on and so forth, even running behind a proxy, access logging, you can basically find the documentation in here. This is all for now. Catch me on the next one. Now that you know about embedded web servers, Tomcat, and how to configure it properly, what I want to show you is how we're going to build a simple API that we can send a HTTP request to it, and then we'll get a response. So basically here, we want to use Chrome to send a request to our application, to our Spring Boot application. Remember, we have Tomcat listening on port 8080, and then the application will process the request and then respond with the text, hello. So let's go back to IntelliJ and to build a simple API within Spring Boot, let's go ahead and have a method within our main class. So outside the main method, just say public. And in here, I'm going to say string. So this will be return type. I'm going to say greet and this will return. So let's just say return and then hello. There we go. Now, in order for us to expose this method as a REST endpoint for clients to use as GET requests, we have to use this annotation here, at, and then GET mapping. And with at GET mapping, we have to pass in a path. So basically, I'm going to say forward slash, and you'll see this in a second. And also, in order for this to work, we have to annotate this class here with at, and then REST controller. This means that any method within this class that has any of these annotations, so get mapping, post mapping, put mapping, so on and so forth, they'll be exposed as REST endpoints that clients can call. Cool. Now, what I need to do is restart my server. And you can see that the application started on port 8080. Let me open up Chrome. And before on port 8080, we had the 404 status code, meaning that the path, so forward slash, had no mapping. But now if I basically send the same request, check this out, we have hello in here, which is really nice. So localhost 8080, this is the root. Let me show you. In here, we said forward slash, this is the root. Now, if I was to change this to greet in here and reload the application, go back to Chrome. And if I reload, you can see that 404, meaning that we don't have an explicit mapping for the root path. But what we have is forward slash and then greet. And you can see that we have hello in here. So there you have it. This is your first API with Spring Boot. Before we move any further, let me go ahead and explain these annotations that you see here at Spring Boot Application, REST Controller, as well as Get Mapping. First, let's start with Spring Boot Application. So this annotation right here. So within the textbook, you can see that I have a section on annotations and this annotation at Spring Boot Application is part of Spring Boot. And basically it's a wrapper for encapsulating add configuration at enable auto configuration and add component scan. So instead of you having these three annotations, you could just have this one right here. And it's like you having these three annotations. But what do they really mean? 
Let's begin with ads configuration, which is part of Spring. In here, if I click on Spring, you can see that we have a bunch of annotations. And right here, if I click on configuration, you see that the ads configuration basically is used for configuration classes and conventionally called app config. This is where you have a bunch of configuration code for your application. Maybe you've got some connection details of your database, so the username, the password, and you wanna have a class that basically binds those properties into your class or bean, then you can use at configuration in here. Now you'll see throughout this course how we're going to use these annotations, but in a nutshell, that's what it does. Then moving on to the at enable auto configuration. So this annotation right here makes Spring to guess the configuration based on the jar files available on the class path. So if you've got some libraries, it can basically configure it for you without you having to do anything. And I'm gonna show you in a second how all of this works. And finally, we have add component scan. And this one right here, so add component scan, it's right here. So add component scan. And basically it's responsible for telling Spring where to look for components. So this annotation is part of the Spring Boot application, as I said, and by default, Spring will search within the package that the main class is located. So if you have the root package, then it will look for components within the root package. Now, let me actually show you all of this in action. So back to IntelliJ, and right here, if I basically press command and then click on Spring Boot application, I can navigate into it right here. And you can see that basically um, this right here, it's an interface, Spring Boot application. And uh, more specific is actually an annotation. And this is how you define annotations. And basically, if I scroll down, you can see that it's an alias for enable auto configuration component scan, as well as configuration in here. Now, if I close this, and if I was to comment this out, and here, what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to say that this is at component scan, and also at enable auto configuration. Or in fact, let me just remove this, and I wanna show you something. So if I restart the application, you can see that web application could not be started as there was no, and then org, spring, framework.boot, and then the servlet in here, right? So basically, um, it's telling us to check dependencies for supported servlet web server, right? So we know that we have Tomcat installed as a dependency, but at the moment, there's no way for configuring it because we haven't told it to do so. So here, this is where at, and then enable auto configuration comes in. If I run this, you can see that now the application starts on port 8080. So here, if I hide this, also what I forgot to show you is, so within component scan here, we can say, base packages and we can basically say com dot amigos code so i'm actually telling it the package that it should look for uh components and i'll show you components in a second as well as beans but if i run this this works as well so here we are being uh, basically more specific on the packages that we want the components to be instantiated from this is it, right? So these uh, annotations right here, and also you saw that there's the at um, configuration. And basically if we have uh, any bean inside that we want to instantiate, this annotation in here works quite well with it. But if I restart, I just wanna show you that basically everything works as before, but instead we just have one single annotation right here, which is Spring Boot application. Without this annotation, the application will not start. So if I remove this, run it, you can see that we get an error 
and basically is missing annotations on how to configure things properly. But this annotation, it's very important and you'll see it in all main classes for Spring Boot applications. If you have any questions on this annotation, please do let me know. Next, let me briefly talk about REST controller as well as get mapping. So at REST controller and at get mapping, these are annotations which are part of the Spring Web MVC. The Spring Web MVC model view controller, it's a framework that provides a very easy way of implementing MVC architectures in our web applications. Spring MVC basically abstracts away a lot of messy details. You would have to understand and manage yourself if you were to write servlets manually. So you know what a servlet is. It's a process which handles HTTP requests. So a client sends a request and then it also gets a response. So Spring Web MVC basically abstracts all of that away and allows us to create RESTful services very easy. And within Spring Web MVC, there's a bunch of annotations that we should be aware of. So we've got controller, at REST controller. So here, this one is a very convenient for at controller and at response body. So basically, this controller right here marks the class as a web controller. It marks the class as a web controller. And with this, Spring can auto detect the implementation classes being by scanning the class path and at rest controller is the controller with the add response body and together this indicates that the class is a controller and all the methods in the marked class will return a json response so the response body right here is a utility annotation that tells spring to automatically serialize return values of this class methods into HTTP responses. Then moving down, so we have request body, we've got at request mapping in here, and basically this specifies a method in the controller that should be responsible for serving HTTP requests to the given path. So at get mapping is basically an abbreviation of at request mapping. And this is basically instead of you uh, having to say this in here. So request mapping and then specify the method and the path. You could just say at get mapping and then pass the path in it. At get mapping is mainly for HTTP get requests and Get mappings are for read in the CRUD uh, operations. Then you have post mapping, which is the create. You've got put mapping, update, delete mapping for delete. And then you've got request params, uh, path variables and whatnot. And you'll learn about um, these in a second. So I just wanted to give you an introduction of these annotations. So within IntelliJ right here, so as we mark this with at rest controller, now we are able to have methods within it that we can expose as rest endpoints to create APIs. So here we are basically saying hello, but if I was to have a class in here, so let me just say record, and then I'm going to say greet response, for example. And in here, I'm going to have the actual um, response. So string and then greet, just like that. And what I'm going to do is instead of returning hello, which you saw gives us just a string in the console. So let me actually show you. So if I run main and then go back to Chrome, if I reload in here, you can see that we have hello. Have a look, hello. But if I change the return type, 
So instead of a string, I'm going to say greet response right here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to basically say new greet response and then say hello, for example. So I'm just going to say the same thing inside. Cool. If I reload, go back to Chrome and then reload this page, have a look. So now we actually have a JSON object and this is what I was saying. So within the annotations, the rest controller right here indicates that the class is a controller and all the methods in the marked class will return a JSON response. So this is exactly what just happened. And obviously if you want to change from JSON to XML, you can also do it. But at the moment we are just working with JSON objects. And this is pretty much it. So back to IntelliJ and I think by now you should have a good understanding of the main class, these annotations that we've used so far. If you have any questions, please do let me know. Catch me on the next one. All right. You saw that we basically have an API currently when we say forward slash greet, we get a response in this JSON format. Now I just want to show you exactly, you know, what is doing this behind the scenes so that you understand what is going on. So if I go back to IntelliJ and in here, have a look. So we have a record in here. And basically records, they are classes that allows us to achieve immutability. So we get all arguments constructor equals hash code, all the fields are finals. And basically instead of us having to write, so let me just show you the equivalent as a class. So in here, so if I just comment this for a second, now we get an error, but that's because in here, if I just say class, and then I'm going to say greet and then response. And for this greet response, what we have is just the greet field. So this would be private final and then string and then greet. And with this, we have one constructor. So let's just refactor this. And we also have the getter in here. So get greet. We also have the to string. There we go and equals and basically I think we can generate equals and ash code. So let's just generate like this. So equals and hash code next, 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 next. And there we go. So basically this is the same as having, so you can see that we have so many lines of code in here, but Basically this and this class that I've just created is the exact same thing. So if I reload and then go back to Chrome and if I refresh, you can see that this still works. Now greet right here. This is the instance field that we have. And then this is the actual value. So we did IntelliJ in here. So have a look greet. So that's the key. And then the value is hello in here. And you'll see how basically we'll build more complex responses, but in a nutshell, this is what's happening. Now, the reason why we get that response is because of this getter right here. So if I was to remove this get method and then reload, go back to Chrome and refresh, have a look, we do get a 406 status code. So basically we get an error in here. And if I go back to IntelliJ and hide this, so you can see that having the getter here, it's really important in order for us to get the correct value that we set when we pass within the constructor. Now, what is behind all of this, right? So the reason why we can get the JSON object from this class right here called greet response is because of a library called Jackson. 
So within IntelliJ, if I open up project and then open up the external libraries and in here, so you can basically search, but it's right here, com faster XML. So if I put this bigger so you can see everything. So I will look com faster XML, Jackson core annotations. You've got the core here, data binding, data binding, data types, so on and so forth. So basically this is a library which is doing all the magic for us. So anything that has to do with Jackson, so faster XML Jackson. Now Jackson is, so in here I'm within the official page for Jackson. And basically what they say is that Jackson has been known as the Java JSON library or the best JSON parser for Java or simply as JSON for Java. It's what it does. Now, I'm not going to spend too much going in, in detail how Jackson works and whatnot, but you can see that it's really popular and I would highly advise you to go and read more about Jackson if you're interested on the JSON serialization and deserialization. Throughout this course, you'll see that everything is abstracted for us and by default, what we get is a JSON blob. So if I reload and I think I need to restart the server, so restart and then reload, you can see that we get a JSON object in here. So this is what we are getting by default. Now, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It's a standard text-based format for representing structured data based on JavaScript object syntax. That's all it is. So uh, in here, if I show you, so a structure example, I think what they want to show is basically how you can denote various data types. So here, for example, squad name, this is a string, um, formed, this is a number in here. You have booleans, you have arrays of objects in here. It's arrays are denoted with square brackets. And then within the square brackets, you can have objects or if your array has just strings, basically it's just strings in it. But what is doing all of the magic for you is Jackson. Now, what I want you to do is, you see that this JSON response right here is in one line, but if you have a large JSON response, everything will look ugly. So go and install JSON Viewer. So I'm using Chrome, so just install the JSON Viewer Chrome extension, and it's also available for other web browsers. So in here, I'm just going to enable. There we go. Now, if I go back to the request in here, and if I reload, you can see that now we get a JSON response, which is formatted. So here we can basically um, collapse, expand. We can view the raw response. And basically it's uh, nicer because we can basically have the data well structured so that we can easily see what is going on. If you have any questions on Jackson and Jason, please let me know. But throughout this course, you'll see how we will basically model structured data with an API that we will build in a second. That's all for now. Catch me on the next one. Let me show you two other data types that you will see when uh, basically taking your Java objects to JSON. So I want to show you objects, which is basically this right here, right? So this is our object, but then you'll see object within object as well as arrays. If I go back to IntelliJ and in here, greet right here, what I want to do is I want to have another field. So I'm going to say, private. And what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to collapse this and I'm not going to use this class. And instead I'm going to use the record. So here, what I want to do is I want to have a string right here. So we actually greet, but also let's have favorite programming languages. So I'm going to say this will be a list of strings. And this will be fave pro gramming languages and import list. 
and let's have a person object in here with let's just say person and let's have another record and this will be person and person will have just name so string awesome so we have a record and the greet now we need to change this to basically pass the list of programming languages i'm going to say list dot of let's just say uh, java and then here let's say golang and finally let's say javascript and finally we need to pass a person so person and let's say that this is alex so you see how basically greet so greet response has a string a list of strings and a person right here and basically this is our object in here so new new object let me just extract this to a variable so you see that this is the response that we want to send back to the client right here so this is an object if i reload and go back to chrome if i now reload this you can see that how the shape of this json object now changed so we have the main object so this object right here is this one so is this response in here and within this response we have greet hello then we have so in here we have fave programming languages so that's the key so key and the value key and the value so greet equals to hello faith programming languages equals to an array and then the person key equals to this is another object so if i show you so we've got the response object within we have greet as the key that's the value string then the key right here was fave programming languages and the value was you can see that this denotes the array so square brackets and then we have an array of strings and then we have person so person that's the key and the value is an object so this is what jackson is doing for us so we don't have to do any logic whatsoever to transform our java objects into json objects and one thing that i forgot to show you is let me show you numbers so within intellij so person let's also say that person has age so int and then age and here let's just say that it has uh, some money so double and then um, available and then cash right or let's just say savings this is much better so savings now obviously we have to say that alex is maybe 28 and then he has 30k in his account so 30,000 whoops not like that but 30,000 just like that if I reload go back and refresh Chrome you can see that now so we have age so that's the instance field that we just added to person and then the value was 28 savings and then the value was 30,000. So you can see that this is a decimal and this is a whole number. Okie dokie. This is all for now. If you have any questions on this, please do let me know. But you will get tons of examples throughout this course when we build our APIs, as I said. Now that you have an overview of Spring Boot, what we're going to learn is how to put all of this together where the clients will be able to send put, post, get, and delete requests to our API. And then that will flow through our application, through the business layer, the DAO layer, and then to a real database, which will be Postgres running on Docker. So this is pretty much what you will uh, kind of build when building APIs using Spring Boot. And I will show you exactly what it takes to build this with Spring Boot. And just for reference, this right here is the 
n tier architecture where you have layers and each layer is responsible of performing one and only one single thing and well. Let's begin with our model where the clients will be able to perform a GET request to fetch customers from our database. So we need a model so that we can build the entire API so that we can create, read, update, and delete customers. We'll touch on the database in a second, but for now, let's focus on building this entity right here with Java. Cool, so within the application, let's go ahead and create a new class in here. So class, and this will be called, let's just say customer. There we go. Now this custom will have few things. So we want to have private and then integer ID. We want to have string and then name and make sure that this is private. We also want to have email and finally age. So let's just duplicate this and this will be age. Awesome. Now let's generate the constructor. So I'm just using keyboard shortcuts and you can see them down below. This also I will put in a new line just like that. So it's visible to you and let's have a no args constructor and you'll see why we need this in a second. So constructor and then select none. Let's have the getters and setters. So here getters and setters. And if you want to learn more about all these keyboard shortcuts and IntelliJ, I've got a course teaching you all of this. Cool. And then we need equals and hash code. So again, I'm just generating stuff and this is boilerplate code. So in here equals and hash code. There we go. And finally we need a two string. So two and then string. There we go. And I think this is pretty much what we need. So now we have our model and we are good to go. Next, let's get a database up and running so that we can store customers. Cool. The next thing that we want to do is we want to get a database up and running with Docker. And we also need a data source from within our Spring Boot application. And this is just a factory for connections to the physical database that we will get up and running very soon. Then we're going to configure our model with JPA, which stands for Jakarta Persistence. And formerly it was known as Java Persistence. So you'll see that before it was under Java X in here, but now it's under Jakarta package. And basically it's a specification that describes the management of relational data in enterprise Java applications. So we can take our Java classes and then map it into a database table and we can interact with our database without ever having to write any SQL code. So once we have that, we will configure an interface that extends a special class that allows us to perform all the CRED operations against our table, which will be mapped by this customer entity that we did create previously. Awesome. Let's go ahead and get this database up and running. Cool. Now that you have Docker up and running, let's basically create a special file under the root folder in here. So I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to name this as docker compose dot and then yaml. Now this file is very special for us because it will enable us to specify some services that we can run. And the services that we really want is a Postgres instance running on Docker. So we want a container running on Docker. So what I want to do is under the description of this video, you can find a link for this code, which I'm going to paste now. There we go. And let me quickly walk you through. So here, this is just some YAML configuration, but we have services, then we have DB. So this is the name of the service. Then we have a container name. So here we've just called it Postgres. You can call it something else. Then this is the Docker image. We pass some environment variables, including the username and the password and where to store data. 
and we also define some volumes we expose the port so in here i'm saying 54332 mapping to 5432 so this is so that if you have a postgres instance running locally then there's no conflicts so sometimes people have postgres installed locally and if you do then it will connect to that database instead of this one so to remove the ambiguity, I've just said 5332 in here. Then we have some networks. So I've just called it DB and I'm saying to restart unless stopped. And here I also have some networks and here I define the volume. Now with this in mind, what you can do is within IntelliJ, you can actually run this service. So here, if you're using the ultimate edition, you'll have the plugin already installed. If not, just install the plugin and then you will be able to run this. And you can see the command that it uses is Docker Compose. If you don't want to do this through IntelliJ, what you can do is you can run it within your terminal. So let me show you. So here you can run it within your terminal. So here if I open up the terminal and we basically say Docker Compose up and then dash and then D for detached mode. So that is it. But I'm not going to run this through here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the services in here. And you can see that this is now creating the Postgres database, which is done. I already have the image and um, there we go. So here, if I expand this, you can see that we have the database in here. And if I click on it, you can see that we have some logs and it says database is ready to accept connections. So we are good to go. And also if you want to check within the terminal, so let me just show you quickly. So a terminal, and if I put this bigger, clear the screen, if I say Docker compose and then PS, you can see that we have the database right here. The port is five, three, three, two mapping to five, four, three, two on the container. And I can say Docker logs, and then I can say Postgres. So Postgres is the name of the container, which is running. And if you want, you can say dash F to follow. And you can see that we get the exact same thing. So the database is up and running to accept connections. Cool. Next, let's configure our Spring Boot application to connect to this database. I've just pressed Control C to come out of that. That's all for now. Catch me in the next one. Before we can actually start configuring the data source and all the other configuration needed, we need to install PostgreSQL JDBC driver. So this is an open source JDBC driver written in pure Java, and it basically allows Java programs to connect to a PostgreSQL database using standard database independent Java code. So in here, you'll see that basically this is a way that you can use a simple query to select from a table. Now, we're not going to use this in specific because we're going to use Spring Data JPA, but we still need to have this driver because Spring Data JPA depends on it. So to install it is as simple as opening the POM file. So let's open up the POM.xml and within POM.xml, under so under dependencies so literally anywhere so i'm just going to put it at the top here it doesn't really matter the order so under dependencies we need to have the driver so i'm going to say dependency and this will be postgresql and this should come from org.postgresql cool then one thing that i'm going to change this i'm going to say that the scope for this is runtime so we need this dependency only during runtime Nice. Now let's reload Maven changes. And there we go. The next dependency that we need is Spring Data JPA. So as I said, we're going to use JPA, which pretty much allows us to map Java classes to database tables. And then we can use a class to directly interact with our database without having to write any SQL code. Now Spring Data JPA is part of the larger Spring Data family which makes it easy to implement JPA based repositories. So this module really, it's a wrapper that enhances support for JPA based data access layers. So I actually have an entire course on Spring Data JPA, but for now, 
follow along because what we're going to cover should be easy to grasp. So to install Spring Data JPA, we need to we need to go back to our pom.xml and after the driver, let's add yet another dependency. And this time, this will be Spring dash boot dash starter dash data JPA. And this comes from org dot spring framework dot boot. And cool. So this is pretty much what we need. Let's reload Maven changes and job done. Next, let's add the required configuration for connecting to our database from within our Spring Boot application. Cool, we are almost there. Now let's configure a data source using application.yaml or properties so that we can obtain a connection from within our Spring Boot application. So within IntelliJ, open up SRC, main, resources, and then application.yaml. And in here, what we're going to do is the following. So again, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna paste some configuration and this will be within Spring, so here, and you can grab all of this as well. And the first thing that we do is, let me just actually collapse all of this. Within Spring, we have data source with three keys, URL, username, and password. The URL, basically this is using Postgres, QL, and here localhost 5332, and then customer. So this is a database that we're going to create in a second. So here, this port is the same as the one you find under here the username and password so have a look username and password amigos code password so the same in here amigos code and then password then this is jpa specific so here we are saying that we want to basically destroy the schema at the end of the session and here we are using postgres dialect we want to format the sql and also we want to show sql now What's really important here is that the indentation is the exact same thing as you see in here. So for example, push this to the right and you see that now it doesn't recognize, cannot resolve configuration property because the indentation is incorrect. So make sure that the indentation is exactly as it is in here. And also we've got main and this is uh, what you saw before. Awesome. Now let's try and start the application and see what happens. So if I basically start the application here, run, this should fail. There we go. And this is because in here, have a look. So in here, it says that database customer does not exist. So we have to create this database. Let's go ahead and do that next. In order for us to create this database in here called customer, let's together. So within IntelliJ, open up the terminal and uh, we're going to connect to the database through the terminal. Now we could use this database client right here. And I know that some of you might not be using the IntelliJ Ultimate Edition. So let's do together through the terminal and this will work for everyone. So here, let's say Docker and then PS. Now you can see that we have Postgres in here, I've got my SQL as well running in here, but you should have Postgres and have a look. Names Postgres, take this name and then I'm gonna clear the screen by pressing Control L. I'm going to say Docker exec dash IT and then Postgres and then space and then bash. So this allows us to execute shell commands within the container. Now we want to use PSQL which is the client for connecting to a Postgres database, dash U for user, and then Amigos code. Awesome, you can see that now we are connected. Now if I say backslash L to list databases, list databases, you can see that we have Amigos code, Postgres, template zero, and template one. So these are the default that come with Postgres. And also we instructed to create Amigos code. Now what we want is customer. So let's just say together, create and then database customer in lowercase and then semicolon. Important for you to have semicolon. Press enter and there we go. We get 
create database back. And if I say backslash L once more, you can see that now we do have customer right here and we are good to go. Now, if you want to come out of this shell, just press control D and then here you come out of PSQL. Now you are within the container itself, control D again, and you're out of the container. If you want to connect again, I've just pressed control L to remove everything from the screen, run the exact same command and then PSQL dash U amigos code, enter backslash and then L. And you can see that we have customer in here. Cool. Now let's hide this and start the application and restart the application and see whether we have any errors. And ta -da, you can see that everything works and we have no errors and the application started on port 8080. This is all for now. Catch me on the next one. Cool, we have the database up and running. We also have our model. We have got the data source. Now let's use JPA so that we can map our customer entity to our database. And then we'll create a repository. So a class called customer repository that allows us to perform CRUD operations on this entity right here. Cool, so we already installed Spring Data JPA and basically implementing a data access layer of an application has been cumbersome for a while. And Spring Data JPA aims to significantly improve the implementation of data access layers by reducing the effort of the amount that's actually needed. As a developer, you write your repository interfaces, including custom finder methods, and Spring will provide the implementation automatically. And within IntelliJ, we have this class called customer. And here, this is where things begin. So we're going to use this special annotation from, so say at and then entity. So the very first one here from Jakarta.persistence. Before Spring 3, this used to be from Java X, but now it's moved into this new package. Nice. Now that we have this entity, we have to specify the ID. So this right here is actually complaining, right? So customer should have a primary key. So let's define an ID for this. And to define the ID is as simple as having the annotation of ID from the same package. So at and then ID. And now that we have the ID in place, we have to say this. So we have to have a sequence generator from the exact same package. And this is because we are using Postgres. So here, let's define a name for this. So this will be customer underscore ID sequence and the sequence name. So sequence, so sequence name in here will be the same. So let's just grab this and paste this here. Now we have to specify the generated value. So basically this is how we say, right? So now we want this to be generated based off the sequence. So strategy and the strategy will be generation type. So generation type and then sequence. And finally, which generator? Well, the uh, customer ID sequence that we've just created in here. And to be honest, this is pretty much the bare minimum that we need in order to have this class right here be mapped to our database. So with this, what we get is a table called customer with four columns, ID, name, email, as well as age. And also we get a sequence out of it. Next, let's restart the application and see this in our database. So in here, what I want to do is I want to restart the application. And in here, if you look into the logs, you should see that we have, so in here, so the server uh, is starting and then have a look, drop table if exists, customer cascade, drop sequence if exists, customer ID sequence, right? So this is the table and this is the sequence. And then create sequence. And then we have the create table customer, integer ID, not null, age, integer, email, varchar, name varchar, primary key. And this is the ID, which is this guy right here. So basically, these 
they are so if i show you remember customer so have a look so we have basically id id we've got age age we've got email email we've got name name in here and then primary key is because of this guy right here and then the sequence sequence customer id sequence is because of this guy right here so sequence name customer id sequence now let's open up the terminal and go back to the database so if you forgot how to get inside so basically just say docker exec dash it postgres bash and then psql dash u amigos code awesome now if i say backslash l in here you can see that we have these databases but the one that we are interested in is customer so to connect to customer say backslash c and then customer press enter and now you are connected to database customer which means that i can say backslash d and then t and you can see that we have one relation so we've got customer and it's a table if i do backslash d it shows me all relations and in here have a look we've got the customer table as well as the sequence customer id sequence so if i was to write some sql so let's just say select and then start from customer so we want to select all the columns from customer and this will give me all the rows present in the database if i press enter you can see that we have zero rows and to be honest we done it so you can see how powerful this is without us having to write any sql code we've got the table as well as the sequence next what we need to do is to create a repository that will perform all the cred operations and any extra queries that we want against this table right here called customer that we just created Cool, now let's create this interface right here called customer repository. And uh, we need to extend a special class and you'll see how this interface will allow us to interact with our database, performing all the CRUD operations without writing any SQL whatsoever. Back to IntelliJ and in here, if I collapse this, let's create a new and then Java class type interface and let's just call it customer repository cool now this right here will extend so this extends and then jpa and then repository now this guy works with some generics and we need to have these diamonds in here and the first data type that we have to pass is the entity itself which is customer and then second the data type for customer id so customer id data type is integer so let's just take this and put it here and job done now that we have this customer repository we can inject in whatever class that we need and it will have superpowers meaning that we can perform all the cred operations insert create delete read and a bunch of other queries that we might want to have so if we look into jpa repository if i go into it you can see that we have have a look we've got find and then t so t is basically what we we specified which is customer find all we can perform a sorting we can find all by id we can flush we can get by id we can get reference but this is all actually deprecated but what I want you to see is that this right here extends CRUD repository and pagination and sorting, which means that it gets all of the methods from this and this. So if I go into CRUD repository, you can see that we have save, find by ID that gives us an optional, exists by ID, find all, we can perform a count, we can delete by ID, we can delete an entity, 
delete all by ID. If you want to remove everyone from your table, you can do so, which I wouldn't advise you to do this ever in production, but you get the idea. Cool. So now that we kind of have an understanding of uh, this interface right here, and we actually extended it. So we get all the methods that it comes with. Next, let's go ahead and basically start putting everything together. Now that we have everything configured, we can focus our attention in building our API. Let's start with a get to this path API v1 customers and uh, the client will send a request using a get method. Then we'll perform a read from the database using our DAO. And then we return the customers back to the client. So let's open up IntelliJ. And in here, let's open up main. So we've done stuff within main. So let's just keep things simple for now. But if you want to follow the NT architecture, in my course, I'll show you basically how to structure everything properly using dependency injection and the benefits and whatnot. But for now in here, let's have, so we're going to have a method. So I'm going to say public and then a list of customers and get and then customers. Cool. Now get customers in here will return customers, right? So let's just say list dot and then of. So an empty list for now. And you've seen this, right? Now this will be at and then get mapping and we can provide the mapping in here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide this at the root level. So I'm going to say add and then request mapping and the request mapping will be API forward slash V1 forward slash and then customers. Nice. So now anytime that someone visits this path, they will receive an empty list. So if I restart this, there we go. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up Postman and Postman is a REST client that allows us to test our APIs. So if you want to learn more about Postman again, in the course, um, I teach you basically how to use Postman, but it's really straightforward. So here, let's basically send a get request to localhost 8080 API V1 and then customers. If I send this request, you can see that we have an empty array. Now, what we want really is data coming from our database. So how do we do it? Well, let's go back to IntelliJ. And in here, what we need to do is the following. We have to inject, so private, and then final, and then customer repository, just like that. And let's have this as a constructor parameter into main. And from this point onwards, we could just say, so instead of returning a list, we could just say customer repository dot, and then have a look, which method do you think we should use? Find all equals count. What is it? Have a look, find all. So we want to find all customers. And to be honest, this is it. So let's restart the application. There we go. Go back to Postman and then send the request. And you can see that this works. So we have a status code of 200 and we have an empty array. Now let's open up our database and manually add a customer. So we did IntelliJ and in here you can see the query that it was sent. So select from customer. So you can see that we're not even writing any SQL and everything is done for us. So let's open up the terminal. So let's say insert and actually let me just say backslash D and then customer. So you see basically the columns that we need. So here, let's just say insert into and then customer and let's have ID and then name, email and age and then values and for the values. So here, the first thing that we want, and actually let me just put this on a new line. So all of this enter. So now let's have uh, values and the values. So within parentheses, so this will be next and then val for the sequence. So the sequence was called within single quotes. Let's have customer underscore ID and then sequence. 
and um, the name so this will be alex the email this will be alex at gmail.com and alex is 22 so we've got the id and then name email as well as age now end this with semicolon and press enter and you can see that we have the insert did work now let's also add someone else so let's just say here jamila jamila and then this is jamila at gmail.com and jamila she is let's say 33 press enter this works now let's go to postman and then send the get request to api v1 customers and you can see that now we get alex id1 so this is what the next val does for us so we don't have to mess about with the sequence and then we have jamila in here and you can see that this works beautifully and if you notice in here so the id went from 1 to 51 and this is because if i go back to intellij within our customer entity in here if we look at the sequence generator if i just go into it so command and navigate into it you can see that the allocation size is 50 so this is how it increments so if i add someone else let's just add jamila again so i'm going to press the up arrow and then insert so the same insert command open up postman and then send the request you can see that now it's 101 so basically it's a 50 increment for the id so if you want to change that it's super easy go back to your entity and in here what we need to do is so if i close that we say allocation so allocation size and you can also see the initial size so if i restart the server now basically everything gets destroyed because of this property in here so create drop let me show you so if i send the request no one in the database let's manually insert them so open up the terminal and let's press the up arrow once twice and then three times so we have alex first so the insert works let's have jamila there we go now let's send the same request and you can see that now the id went from one two three four five increment by one cool so this is it and also i forgot to show you within intellij in here so if i press ctrl l and then say select star from customer semicolon you can see that we get the exact same result so this is me interacting with the database whereas postman is going through our api and getting data back if you have any questions on this please let me know otherwise catch me on the next one Now let's learn how the client will be able to store some data through our API. So we want the client to send a post request in this case. So get request is for getting an existing resource. Post is for adding a new resource. So the resource will be this JSON object in here. And this will go through our API. Then basically we do some stuff within and then we have some business logic within and then the dao is responsible for storing the data so in our case the dao is our repository let's switch to intellij and learn how to do this so here you saw that we can basically insert into customer but this is us directly storing data in our database but what we want is to expose an api endpoint that clients can basically achieve the exact same end result so within IntelliJ, let me hide this and then let's go into main in here. And in order for this to happen, what we need to do is to have a method, so public. And then here, let's just say void. We don't return anything. And what we want to say is add and then customer. So we want to add a customer. And inside, we're going to receive a new customer request. And we're going to create this in a second. So request and in here what we're going to do is the following so first let's have the new customer request so this can actually be a record in here so let's just say record and then new customer request 
there we go and i think we have to make this static there we go and here we're going to accept a few things we're going to accept the name so string name we're going to accept string email and also we're going to accept the email and finally we're going to accept h so integer and then h so obviously we could have this in its own file but for now let's just have it like that easy to follow and what we're going to do is we're going to basically create a new customer so we're going to say customer and then customer equals to new and then customer and now let's use these setters so customer dot set and then here we're going to say name this comes from the request dot and then name we also need age as well as email so let's do email first so email so say email this will be email and finally age there we go and this will be set and then age now that we have the customer we can invoke our repository to save it so let's just say customer repository dot and then save and then inside we pass customer just like that and you can see how beautiful this is so we get the request and then we basically take that request convert to a customer and then we save it now we need the annotation so at and then post mapping so this time is not a get mapping but post mapping and the request that comes from the client we need to be able to capture that from the request body so the request body will be a json object that will be mapped into this guy in here awesome let's restart the application there we go so we lost everything now let's open a postman and in here i already have this so let me just copy this json object and this time this will be a post request to the same path open a body so this is the request body raw and then change this to json format paste that in and now we're going to send jamila so let's just try and send jamila and see how this works so if i send you can see that we have a 200 this is cool now let's get basically everyone from uh, the database send and you can see that jamila was added see we sent jamila in here without a given id and now it's been saved into our database let's also send alex alex and alex is 21 and change this to post again send 200 and if i say get send and you can see that this is working so basically now this endpoint is saving to our database if i open up intellij and you can see so this is the select query but if you look into basically the sql for inserting this is it insert into customer age email name and id so this is what we've done within the terminal remember insert into customer and then id name email and age now let's just say select start from customer within our database and you can see that it works awesome and you can see how our api is evolving so we can read from our system we can create now we need to delete and update next let's learn how to delete awesome so what we want to be able to do is to delete a customer so any customer from our system so let's basically learn what we need to do in order for that to happen so what we need to do is the following so let's have a method so let's say public and then delete customer this would be void so here so void and what we're going to receive from the client is the id so integer and then id now at this point what we're going to do for now i know we could you know have you know business logic checking if the customer exists and whatnot so here i'm just being straightforward and basically not performing any business logic but what we need to do now is invoke our repository and then say dot and then delete by id passing the id so you can see how this repository here has everything that we need in order to perform cred operations now we have to do two things one is we have to annotate this with add and then delete mapping so delete 
basically allows someone to delete an existing resource from our backend application. And this ID here will be part of the path. So when someone says localhost, so in here, so when someone goes to this path, I want them to say forward slash one, this will be the ID, right? So forward slash one. Now, where is this coming from? Well, this will come from here and this will be customer ID. And we have to surround this with curly brackets, just like that. Now you can see that this is complaining and that's because we have to grab this and then map it into this variable. And the way to do it is with at and then path and then variable. And here we can be more specific. We can just say that the name of the variable is customer ID. And this is it. Now let's restart the application. Open up Postman. And here, let's just post. We're going to post Alex. Send. And then let's get everyone. Send. You can see Alex is here. Now, in order for us to delete Alex, we could say delete request to forward slash one. So forward slash one is Alex ID. So forward slash one means that one is the ID for Alex, right? So Alex has ID of one. So now if we send this request and make sure that this is a delete and we don't have to send anything within the body. So we could just say none and then send and check this out. So status. Now, if I try and get everyone again, so let's just get everyone send. And you can see that Alex is no longer available. And to be honest, this is how to implement delete. If you have any questions, please do let me know. Otherwise, catch me on the next one. So you saw that from now, I've given you everything that you need in order to build these two next features. So the first exercise is for you to implement the ability of deleting a customer. And then the second exercise is the ability of updating an existing customer. So you have everything in place in order for you to attempt these exercises. Go ahead and give it a try. And I'm going to post the solutions for the exercises on the GitHub repo. So for now, catch me on the next one. Cool. So we have in here, we have get customers using get mapping. We've got post mapping. We've got delete mapping. Now, what I want to do is I want to challenge you with an exercise where I want you to be able to edit an existing customer. So edit. So if you want to edit someone, you should use put mapping, meaning that you want to update an existing resource. Yeah. So put mapping will work almost the same as at customer. So you need to pass the fields that you want to update for a given customer. Also, you need to include the customer ID inside the path. And let me just show you how you have to do this. So here, so we have to say put mapping and then the customer ID, this will be update and also from the request body. So from the request body, as we've done in here, you need to grab all the contents that you need the client to be able to update. Maybe you just want to update the name or the email, right? Or maybe the three of them. So in that case, you can create a new record or class that represents those and then receive it inside here and then perform the logic to update a customer. Now to update a customer, all you have to do is you basically do the same as we've done here. So you find the customer by ID and then you set the values with the ones that the client sends you. And then you just say customer repository dot and then save. Cool. Give that a go and you'll find a solution on the GitHub repository. This is pretty much it. Catch me on the next one. All right, so you saw that we managed to implement get, delete, post, put, I've left for you 
as an exercise. And we also managed to have a real database up and running with Postgres. Now, the thing here is that basically you should be organizing your applications using the entire architecture or any other architecture that you or your team adopts. But in a nutshell, so here in the beginning, we spoke about this architecture in here where you've got the API layer. So this only has the controllers. So basically everything that handles HTTP requests in Spring Boot World, they are named controllers. Then you have service classes for business logic and then DAO for accessing the database. So in our case, we have our DAO, which is a class on its own. Now, what we have to do is to separate business as well as the API layer. So back with the IntelliJ, so here, what you really want to do is you want to take all of this. So you want to take all of this, put it inside of its own class, name it as controller, the same with this, and basically everything that has the annotation. Then the method in here that it's invoked is within this service. And then the service invokes the repository itself, basically as it is in this diagram. Cool. So we're just going to end here, but I just wanted to basically focus more on Spring Boot and how to create a RESTful API connected to a real database. And uh, hopefully you can see how powerful is Spring Boot. This is all for now. Catch me on the next one. Hey, I'm so happy that you've managed to reach this far and uh, congratulations. You have the basic skills on Spring Boot 3. Obviously, this is a sneak peek and I do have a 25 plus hours course teaching you everything you need to know about Java and Spring Boot, enabling you to go off and secure jobs as a junior developer or if you are a mid senior developer and you want to upskill as part of your organization, then the course also applies to you because we go from the basics all the way to advanced. So I'm going to leave a link where you can basically check the course out and also a card somewhere here or here. And uh, if you're not part of the community, go ahead and join. We've got an amazing community on Discord as well as Facebook where you can interact and ask questions. And I would like you to come and share your knowledge. This is pretty much it. Don't forget to smash the like button if you enjoyed this video. Comment down below and I'll catch you on the next one. Assalamu alaikum.